I'm Dave Stouffer, and this is Episode 7 of J.C.'s World, a reading for the Washington Public Library. In the world of the Reverend Mr. J.C., things are going pretty well. He's busy learning building and repair skills from Pastor James. He's learning a lot about the Bible and Christian faith as he studies along with the Spruce Street Girls. The community garden is starting to grow, but is he ready to handle things on his own? A few days later at breakfast, James told J.C., I've been thinking about going to my old army reunion. The Corps of Engineers is getting together. Think I'll make a trip of it, visit some of my old buddies, take a couple of weeks. You'll be okay, won't you? You can handle this. James figured J.C. couldn't mess it up too badly in two weeks. At 2 a.m., the phone rang. J.C. woke up. The phone rang again, and J.C. thought, James will get it. He always does. The phone rang again, and then J.C. realized James wasn't there. He had left that morning for his Army reunion in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. J.C. stared at the phone, sat at the side of the bed, and finally, after what seemed like forever, he picked it up. Hello, this is Reverend Wesley. Reverend Wesley, this is Nurse Potter at Miners Hospital. Yes, Nurse Potter, what can I do for you? As he said those words, J.C.'s mind was screaming, Nothing, please, nothing, nothing. Nurse Potter's next words were, I need to speak to Reverend Edwards. Is he available? Um, no, Reverend Edwards is away for several days. Can I take a message for him? J.C. heard a sigh on the line. Well, I really wanted Reverend Edwards, but you'll have to do. Feeling slightly stung by the implication, J.C. replied, Do? Do what? Am I correct, Reverend Wesley, that Richard and Elizabeth Sanders are members of your church? J.C.'s mind whirled as he sorted out names and faces, and finally it rested on a young couple. Richard, or Dick as everybody called him, worked at the local supermarket sorting produce. A happy fellow, always smiling, always full of suggestions about dishes you could fix with what he sold. And Elizabeth, Liz, such a pretty thing. Worked as a clerk typist for the glove manufacturer at the edge of town until her pregnancy was well advanced and she had taken time off to have the baby. The baby. Was this about the baby? It seemed to J.C. that his mind had been running for several minutes, but it was just a few seconds, and he was replying, Yes, Dick and Liz Sanders are members of our church, Nice young couple. He paused, somehow expecting the next words from the nurse, yet not wanting to hear them. Reverend Wesley, I need you to come to the hospital right now. It's, um, two in the morning, Nurse Potter. I could come around first thing after I get up, usually around eight. The edge in Nurse Potter's voice was sharp. Now is when the Sanders need you, now, not tomorrow, and she hung up. J.C. talked to the empty phone. What do they need me for? What's going on? What do I do? There were no words in the disconnect buzz. He hung up the phone, stood, and then sat down again on the edge of the bed. He knew as sure as could be that there was a crisis, trouble, Something had gone wrong with the delivery. It was the baby. It was Liz. It was something that they were going to expect him to deal with. God, how he hated that sort of thing. That almost sounded like a prayer. God, how he hated that sort of thing. J.C. was so upset that he walked down the hall to James' room and opened the door before he realized James wasn't there. What would James do, he asked himself. He knew exactly what James would do. He would have put on whatever clothes were closest and left the house. J.C. couldn't do that. Never had the house seemed so comfortable. He walked downstairs, turning on lights as he went. It was so dark outside. The lights would make it cheery and light. There's no problem in here. The phone rang again. He looked at his watch. 2.30. He couldn't believe he'd been up for a half an hour pacing and thinking, stomach tangled in knots. Hello? This is Reverend Wesley. 
Rubber, this is Dr. Pierce at Prophetstown Miners Hospital. My nurse said she called you and told you that your services are needed by a young couple over here having a life crisis tonight. And that she was pretty much convinced you weren't going to come. Now see here, Dr. Pierce, I'm a minister. I'm a man of the cloth. Of course I will go where my duty lies. While he was speaking, J.C. was hoping the doctor was going to say things were better and he wouldn't be needed. Reverend Wesley, conditions here have taken a turn for the worst. I'm afraid the Sanders baby stayed with us for just a couple of hours and has now died. As I'm sure you'll understand, those young people are all messed up because of this. We asked them what church they went to, if any, and they said Trinity, and they mentioned Reverend Edwards was their pastor. Do I understand you're new to town, Reverend Wesley? Uh, no, I've been here for a while now, but, um, Reverend Edwards usually handles this sort of thing. I, uh, I have other duties. I hate to do this to anyone at 2.30 in the morning, Reverend Wesley, but you're going to have to handle this situation. If you'd like, I can have one of the hospital orderlies come and get you in the hospital car. Would that help? J.C. realized the doctor was afraid he would not come and was trying to shame him into it. He wondered what the doctor and the nurse had heard about him. For that matter, was he a topic of conversation around the hospital and other places in town? That thought made him mad. He stood taller, squared his shoulders. That won't be necessary, Dr. Pierce, he said with authority in his voice. I'll be there as soon as I get dressed. Where shall I come? The Sanders are in room 227. It's a private room in the obstetrics ward. They can't afford it, but they're getting it tonight. Yes, I see, replied J.C. I'll be there soon. Thank you, Reverend Wesley. I'll see you when you get here. The knots in J.C.'s stomach turned liquid, and he just made it to the bathroom in time. Several minutes later, he cleaned himself up, went back to his room, opened the door to his closet, and looked inside. Usually the process of picking an outfit to wear was fun. Over the past months, it wasn't. It seemed every day was spent in blue jeans, work shirts, steel-toed shoes, and of course, they were the most readily visible in the closet. By now, J.C. knew he'd spent time that he should have been using to travel to the hospital, and he knew he'd be called to account. So he took the things in front of him, khaki work pants, a long sleeve plaid shirt, socks, loafers. He stopped in the hallway just long enough to pick up a jacket and went to his car. It was another one of those very long drives that seemed to be over in minutes, because it was. It took a long time for J.C.'s thoughts to come back, Scared. He was scared. He forced himself to open the door, then stood outside the car, taking deep breaths of the cold spring night air. J.C. looked up at the hospital door, knew that was his target, saw a figure silhouetted in it. It looked as if the figure was waiting for someone, and indeed, when he closed his car door, he saw the head swivel toward him, and the arm beckoned him to come this way. He was trapped. They knew he was there. They were waiting for him. He walked to the door, and when he opened it, the figure spoke. Reverend Wesley? Uh, yes, I, I am. I'm Nurse Potter. We spoke on the phone. I wanted to see you if you came before you went to the room. Nurse Potter directed him down a long hallway and kept talking as they quickly walked. Reverend, I have some friends in Pine Grove. And when I heard you'd come from there, out of curiosity, I asked if they knew you. They said they did. That's not all they said. They said as far as they knew, you were a good person, but they also said they heard you tried to avoid the hard things about your job. J.C. noticed Nurse Potter's eyes 
were focused ahead, not on him, and he was glad. Well, nurse, I don't know exactly who you're talking about or what they said, but I can assure you that I am a minister. Who they are isn't important, Reverend, and you being a minister isn't important, Reverend. What is important is the two kids in room 227. They're hurting. They are in the greatest pain they've ever had to face in their young lives. They don't understand. They want desperately to understand why their baby died. And in a minute, you're going to go upstairs and you're going to go in that room. And I don't know where you're going to get it, but somehow you're going to get the strength and the compassion to be what those young people need. And Reverend, if you screw this up, I personally will see you run out of town. They stopped in front of the elevator and JC realized she was looking straight at him. There was a long silence. JC said, I think I understand, Nurse Potter. And I'd like to ask you to understand that I'm scared and not prepared and really, really, really over my head. I understand, Reverend Wesley. I wanted to be a nurse ever since I was 11 years old, and I thought, you know, it wouldn't have been neat to put Band-Aids on boo-boos and be in the room when daddies met their babies for the first time and wear that pretty white uniform with the starched white cap and the blue bands on it. It was such a beautiful picture I had in my mind. Right up until we were doing practicum on the job training, so to speak. We all rotated. Everybody got a spot in every department. I was in the emergency room the night a man driving his family home misjudged the distance and was hit by a train. My crisp white uniform was matted with blood. Band-aids weren't going to work at all, and there wasn't any sunlit room with flowers on the windowsill, and I had to handle it. I grew up that night. The elevator door opened and Nurse Potter walked off more slowly now. Reverend Leslie, I've been kind of hard on you tonight. But it seems to me that you can walk into that room and grow up a little bit. Or you can walk past that door and go down the hall to the back steps and keep on running from life. JC's face wore a serious look now. He wasn't angry at Nurse Potter. She'd given him some things to think about. He said, I think I'm okay now. Are you a Christian, Nurse Potter? More or less, I guess I am, but not your church. That doesn't matter, Nurse. Will you pray for me while I'm in that room? She exhaled a long breath. She put one hand on each of J.C.'s shoulders, looked him straight in the eyes and said, that's not my style, but I can give you a hug to go on and I'll give you another when you come back out. Now go on in there and see what you're gonna do. She was as good as her word and quickly gave him a firm two-armed squeeze. J.C. saw that they were standing in front of the door marked room 227 and when he turned back, Nurse Potter had already walked away. He hadn't said goodbye or thank you, he realized. While her words had helped and her matter-of-fact attitude had certainly given him something to think about, he was still scared. The door was closed. There was no one in the hall. The lights were dimmed. And he could have just kept on walking down the hall, down the steps, out the door, back to the safe parsonage, he actually started to turn, and then his hand was knocking on the door of room 227. In a rush, before he could think about it, he stuck his head in the room, identified himself, and asked if he could come in. Elizabeth Sanders was propped up in the bed, Dick in a chair next to her. They were holding hands. J.C. mentally gave himself stage directions. This is when you say something. Move closer to the bed, shake their hands, tell them you're sorry. Sorry for what? It's not my fault. 
It's nobody's fault. He approached the bedside and said, Dick and Liz, I've seen you around the church, but haven't really gotten to know you. I'm, he started to say Reverend Wesley, but ended John. And I'm so sorry for your loss. His voice was sincere and his entire being radiated compassion. Dick stood up and somehow the three of them ended in an embrace, awkwardly bending over to include Liz in the bed. There were tears all around. J.C. thought he should be embarrassed that he, a man of the cloth, a minister, was crying in front of parishioners, but it felt right. It seemed the hug and the tears established a meeting ground, and the two men sat down close to the bed, normally in a situation that involved emotion, and particularly in a situation that involved silence. J.C. was quite uncomfortable and consequently talked babbling so there wouldn't be silence and awkwardness but here he sat his mind started with stage directions again this is where you read some scriptures but you didn't even bring a bible o okay then comforting words this is where you say comforting words but i i don't know any i mean i do but i've never been in this situation what what do you say after some time dick broke the silence john we need, Liz and I need, for you to tell us why our baby died. We don't know. We aren't sinners. We grew up in church. We go to church. We try to treat people fair. Why did our baby die? J.C.'s mind was whirling, thoughts jumbled, half-formed phrases. He was sure his mouth was flapping open and shut. He, the man who was glib, who could preach a sermon as well or better than any of his contemporaries, never at a loss for words, could sell snow to Eskimos, they said. He didn't have a word. There was nothing in his brain that answered their question, except one phrase that kept flowing through his thoughts. But that's no answer. That's just a cop-out. Liz and Dick were looking at him. J.C. spoke. Liz, Dick, you and I are kind of in the same place. This has never happened to me to be in this situation, and it's never happened to you either. And I will tell you honestly that I don't have any easy words to explain the death of your baby. I wish I did. I really wish I did. I don't know. That was a phrase that had been bouncing around in his troubled brain. I don't know why your baby died, and neither do you. And neither does Dr. Pierce or Nurse Potter. It just happened. Here's what I believe. Have you ever heard of the scripture, 1 Corinthians 13, that talks about love? Liz said, yes, we had it read at our wedding. We particularly asked for it. Well, I don't have it memorized word for word, but what is occurring to me over and over again as we sit here is where Paul writes, now I see through a glass darkly, then we will see face to face. You know, folks, I've read that in weddings myself. I've read it a hundred times, and I just wonder if that's God speaking through Paul to teach us patience and faith. Because if that's true, the things we don't understand right now will eventually become clear to us. I want to know why your baby died as much as you do. And I, I believe, I believe that someday we will know why. And J.C. believed what he said. And Richard believed what he said. And Liz believed what he said. And they sat through the rest of the night visiting quietly about the memorial service, who, what, when, where, about each other's lives, where they'd been, who they knew, where they thought they were going with honesty and openness. At one point, Dick's eyes flashed to the door behind J.C. Nurse Potter had stuck her head in, listened for a second or two, nodded to Dick, and then closed the door. Finally, J.C. said, Liz needs to get some rest. 
Lou said, I think I can now. And Dick, you need to leave for a while and get cleaned up. Me too, I guess. I know you've told me your parents live away from Prophetstown. You'll need to make arrangements at the funeral home. If you'd like me to, I'll go with you. It was close to 5 a.m. when they went their separate ways. When she saw the door of the room closed a second time, Nurse Potter knocked softly and came to Liz's bedside. Are you okay, honey? Well, I'm not happy, and I hurt like blazes. But something Pastor John said seemed to be just right. And Liz told Nurse Potter what happened. It was just like he was one of us, that he wasn't special like some of those guys with their collars on backwards. He didn't put on airs. He was honest, but he had faith, faith strong enough to believe that we would get an answer. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And Nurse Potter sponged away the tears with a cool cloth. And then Liz slept. James had called from Oklahoma, so J.C. knew when he was due to arrive back in Prophetstown. J.C. had taken upon himself to fix supper, something he didn't do very often, but he knew how much James liked roast beef and mashed potatoes and gravy. This took several calls to Ruth. J.C. had an old, dirty apron wrapped around himself, and he was almost foolishly happy to see James. He found he'd missed James, missed the little banter that they had been establishing, and truth to be told, missed going out with James and his old pickup filled with tools to do this, that, or the other thing. Now, it was strange to think he hadn't much liked James when he came to town. Maybe absence did make the heart grow fonder. Hello, James, he called from the kitchen when he heard the front door open and the thud of James' suitcase on the floor. Did you have a good trip? Was it great to see all your old buddies? Yes, John, it was a great trip. Oh, my, roast beef. Who made it? J.C. set the roast on the table. James settled into a chair. How'd you do while I was gone, John? Oh, nothing much to report. You know the... Sanders, Dick, and Liz, they lost their baby. We had the memorial service at the church. Yeah, I heard about that. I stopped for gas at the truck stop before coming home. Nurse Potter was there. What did you do to her? Well, I didn't do anything to her. I saw her the night I went to the hospital to be with the Sanders. J.C. consciously avoided that story. James didn't need to know everything that had happened. Well, then what did she do to you? Uh, we might have had words or a conversation. I, uh, J.C. stammered, trying to think how to explain what had happened without getting into trouble with James. James interrupted. I don't know what you're trying to say, but what I do know is that Nurse Potter thinks the only reason you don't walk on water is because you don't want to get the bottom of your shoes wet. James chuckled at his own wit and took a sip of coffee. Nurse Potter is one good nurse, he went on, and pretty hard to impress. You sure you didn't do something to her? I just asked her to pray for me. It's been another step for the Reverend Mr. J.C., a big step. If you enjoy hearing about his progress and about the good folks of Prophetstown, Please join me again for another episode of J.C.'s World, the novel entitled The Reverend Mr. J.C. When Appearances Are Not Enough, written by me. I'm Dave Stouffer.